Friends, I welcome you to my channel. Before listening to this story, I will ask you to like and subscribe. It is not difficult for you, but it is pleasant for me. And we're starting. You did well today, Mr. Bennett. Just hold the ice pack on your knee for 30 minutes or more if necessary. You've already taken ibuprofen and acetaminophen, so you don't need more than three hours. Yes, I remember. When are you coming? Well, today is Monday. Tomorrow you will do the exercises, and I will come on Wednesday. Remember, we start working on an earlier schedule on Wednesday. There will be no more late morning workouts. I'll be here at 9, and then you'll have a day off. That sounds good. Drive carefully, Maggie. I'm not going anywhere. The last sentence made her chuckle. I couldn't go anywhere yet. She's nice enough when she's done, but she's a damn sadist when she's working on me. Ten days ago, I had knee replacement surgery on my right knee. I've heard stories about post-operative physical therapy, and there was nothing good about them except it won't last forever. I thought I could survive almost anything if I knew that the end was just around the corner, but probably everyone I know has a higher pain threshold than me. It was torture. The whole idea of physical therapy after knee replacement is to achieve at least 90 degrees of knee flexion. Sounds simple, right? The surgeon cuts the tissues, and then the tissues are restored, connecting with fibers and fusing. The problem is that the cutoff segments tend to attach to everything that is nearby, and physical therapy is designed to destroy all these unwanted attachments until the knee starts working properly and bending properly again. Think about it while you're pouring me a beer. The therapist got into her car and drove away. If anyone is interested, her name is Maggie. Actually, she's a good kid, but she has no pity. She has already heard these screams and knows that pain is the way to recovery. When I feel generous, I call her baby. I think she's about 20 and I'm 57, so she's a kid to me. Not that it matters, but my name is Henry Bennett, and I make custom kitchen cabinets in a small four-person workshop that I own. And yes, one of these people is a woman, and she's a damn good carpenter and cabinet maker, but I'm old school and saying four-person store just doesn't sound right. I'm thinking about expanding my business and making furniture, mostly Windsor chairs, so I'm not thinking about retiring. It feels like I've been getting up and down, squatting, standing, and then kneeling on this hard floor all day, so somehow the cartilage in my knee has worn out, and I got some factory spare parts. So I'm sitting here by my window with my leg up, ice on my knee, and watching Maggie drive away when I notice Jenny Carpenter pulling into her garage across the street. The carpenters are about 20 years old. Chris is also a carpenter by profession, which makes his last name even more ironic. Carpenter is a carpenter, and he is working hard to create his own small company of carpenter contractors. They do a good job and are in demand by homeowners who need repairs and redevelopment, as well as medium-sized companies that often require additional specialists. I know that he dreams of expanding his company to become the main contractor for the construction of new houses and we talked for a long time about how to develop a young company. This is something I know a little bit about. Taking advantage of the opportunity, Jenny is an attractive blonde who works for one of the major investment houses in the city. I liked her. I thought to myself, they really are the perfect couple when I saw a black BMW pulling up to her driveway. It's not often you see cars like this in this neighborhood, and it's not often you see a guy in an expensive suit walk through your neighbor's front door like he's the owner of the house but that's what I saw that day. I'm watching Jenny's house while I've been holding ice to my knee. After half an hour of applying ice to my knee, I go to the kitchen for a sandwich. I know it sounds crazy, but I can't carry a plate and a drink at the same time while I use the damn walker to get back to the living room. So I pack the sandwich in a paper bag and pour the drink into a cup, put both in the stupid basket on the front of the walker and go back to my chair. I get down to my seat and the BMW is still there. I also have some ice so I put the ice pack back on my knee while I sit and look at the neighbor's house across the street. Time is passing. It takes a long hour before the suit finally goes away. Ten minutes later, the garage door opens and Jenny leaves too. Okay, I tell myself, there are a thousand perfectly good excuses for what I just saw. Jenny's not like that. I'm trying to get it out of my head, but I'm bored as hell sitting here. Damn it, I need a book or a crossword puzzle or something else to occupy my thoughts. The workshop called twice with fairly simple questions. I suspect they were just keeping in touch, but I didn't feel abandoned. Having nothing better to do, I decided to look through some books on chair design and started thinking about ideas for a line of simple, stylish chairs that we could make in the workshop. Late in the evening, I was still sitting there, alternately lifting my leg and doing bending exercises, 
then going for an ice pack while I worked on books on chair design. While reading, I drew some design ideas. I was trying to develop something traditional but convenient. It was already dark when I accidentally looked up and saw Chris's SUV pulling into their garage. Jenny's car was already parked in its usual spot. It was then that my thoughts returned to the black BMW and the driver in the fancy suit, who seemed to behave as if he lived here. I started collecting my sketches and notes when I saw Chris crossing the street. He was heading towards my house. I walked slowly to the door and opened it just as he appeared. I stepped back to let him into the house, which turned out to be harder than you'd think with those damn walkers. Chris, what brings you here? Well, Jenny thought that since you're recovering and can't spend much time on your feet, you might like a home-cooked meal. That's why she packed dinner for you and sent me across the street to deliver it. I laughed. I like your girl. As we slowly walked back to the kitchen, I asked, And what has your beautiful wife prepared for this tired old man? First of all, you are not old, but tired. I was still laughing, but Chris was indeed the first visitor all day, except for Nurse Payne, and I enjoyed his company. He put the food on the table and started unpacking it. There was a big bowl of corn stew, some ham biscuits, and a nice salad. My God, there's enough for both of us. Oh no, no way. If I eat even a bite, my wife will find out, and I will have a lot of problems. It's all for you. I admit that I was smiling now. I think there's enough for dinner and for tomorrow's lunch. Please tell your beautiful wife thank you from me. Now may I offer you a beer before you make this long and difficult trek home? Chris was smiling. He knew that my gratitude was sincere. No, she'll be waiting for me. I'd better go. I'll try to come back tomorrow night. I'll be here. I have nowhere to go for the next few weeks. Just as quickly I walked Chris to the door, shook his hand, and he left. Watching my friend walk to his house, I thought about the value of good friends and caring wives. I'm sure I'm wrong about her, I thought. She's not like that. I enjoyed dinner that night. I also felt that I had achieved something with my drawings and notes, so I spent the evening watching TV and reading, and also consumed another bag of ice. Then, after taking another ibuprofen and acetaminophen, I went to bed. Tuesday passed mostly without incident. I made a simple breakfast of yogurt and granola with a glass of orange juice, took ibuprofen and acetaminophen, and then took the coffee to an armchair in the living room. I sipped my coffee for 20 minutes, letting the pills take effect, and then started an unpleasant activity, training my new store-bought knee. No pain, no benefit. My exercises start with a series of simple movements, such as leg lifts and ankle movements. Then I start bending my knee in a supine position, and when I'm ready, I use an elastic band to pull the ankle towards me, forcing the knee to bend. I do repetitions, and by the time I'm breathing like a long-distance runner, I'm ready to stop and put ice on my knee. It's not hard work, but it takes a lot of discipline to pull this tape, knowing it's going to hurt like a son of a bitch. For the next half hour, I'm content to support my leg and apply ice. In the middle of the morning, I am ready to continue my day and return to work on the drawings that I started yesterday. Sitting by the window, I work and observe the world. Neighbors come and go from their homes. Dan Williams mows his lawn. He retired and turned lawn and garden maintenance into an obsession. It probably happens when you're not fishing or playing golf. The Daniels went for a walk in the late morning and later Herb Jackson went for a run. A UPS truck delivers some boxes up and down the street, and eventually the postman delivers the mail. It's funny, but no one seems to see me sitting by the window. I'm working and looking out the window when I see Herb coming up to the Perkins' front door and walking inside. Strange. Jim Perkins is away on business this week. I keep watching and trying to work, and it takes him an hour to get out the back door, walk down the driveway, and head to his house. I tell myself that I'm letting my imagination get the better of me, but at the same time I'm starting to think that maybe I'm living in my own patent place. Does all this really happen when I go to work every day? And what exactly do I see? There has to be an acceptable explanation, so I'm trying to brush it off and get back to work. By the time evening comes, I exercise three times, take pills every three hours so as not to miss the pain, as they say, and finish the last portion of Jenny's corn chowder and ham biscuits. Chris is at home, and I didn't see Jenny until her usual time, so I'm trying to get rid of the thoughts that came flooding back. Wednesday morning comes, and soon Nurse Payne arrives. Before she arrived, I had enough time to make myself a light breakfast to calm those two pills in my stomach and drink some coffee as an upfront reward for what I was about to do. 
She was especially strict with me that day, but claims that my knee is coming back to normal and that she expects full mobility. I remind her that I've never been so flexible, but she just ignores me. I offer her a cup of coffee before I leave, but she says, I've tried your coffee. You can use it to leave stains on furniture. I'm trying to say that there was a time when some furniture manufacturers did just that, but she just shakes her head and says, See you on Friday. Do exercises and apply ice. The nurse's pain is gone, and I'm sitting with an ice pack on my knee and finishing the rest of my cold coffee. After that, everything repeats as on the previous day. Dan is working in his garden that day. The Daniels are taking their morning walk, and I see Herb Jackson visiting Sally Perkins again. I'm telling you, these are the damned Sodom and Gomorrah. It's lunchtime, and I'm getting ready to make a sandwich when I see Jenny Carpenter driving into her garage. I sit down in an armchair, and five minutes later, a black BMW pulls up, and a suit enters the house through the front door. He's been there for almost 90 minutes this time, and all the while, I'm thinking how stupid I'm going to look if I say something to Chris, and it all turns out to be a big mistake. I tell myself that I don't know her family. The suit could be her brother or cousin. He might even be Chris's brother. I don't know. The rest of Wednesday passes without incident. Chris didn't come in for a beer on Tuesday, but late Wednesday night I heard a knock on the door. Is the beer invitation still valid? Of course, do me a favor, take two. I'll be waiting for you in the living room. We spent a pleasant hour before Chris had to go home. I have been watching him closely all this time and have not detected a single note of discontent or absent-mindedness. If something is going on, he is not aware of it. I thought about asking him what he might know about BMW, or if he had relatives who owned such a car but decided that I would never be able to do that. So I gave up this idea. Thursday was a copy of Tuesday. I divided my time between physical exercise and knee treatment, then worked on my projects, took pills, and repeated everything over again. Life was becoming boring and predictable. Meanwhile, Dan was learning the fine art of washing a car, the Daniels were taking a walk, and Herb was visiting Sally Perkins. That old fart has more work to do this week than I have in two years. I suppose I should explain this last point. You see, my wife Peg died two years ago. She was my lover and my best friend. Her death occurred due to the fact that she was in the wrong place and at the wrong time when a distracted city truck driver ran a red light. I was assured that she didn't suffer, but I certainly did. I keep her picture on the table by my chair. Both of our children live their lives as they should, but sometimes it gets lonely. They offered to be with me during my recovery, but I told them that I would be fine. After all, I have a pain nurse who will take care of me. When I told the kids that I was ready to be stuck at home for a few weeks and that I had saved up a few cases of beer to last, my daughter looked at her brother, and the next thing I knew, the refrigerator and freezer were full. I was just joking. It was Friday, and Maggie was punctual as always. I was ready for breakfast, pills, and coffee, so she didn't waste time preparing and started on me. You're making rapid progress, Henry. You must be doing exercises fanatically. If I'm progressing so damn fast. Damn, it hurts. Why do you keep working on me like a village prison guard? Do you have any experience dealing with prison guards? I swear, sometimes I don't know whether to laugh or swear at this woman. The last torture session was over, and she returned from the kitchen with an ice pack. I know that the weekend is approaching, but I want you to continue your exercises on Saturday and Sunday. I took a deep breath and nodded. Then I'll see you on Monday, okay? Okay. There's no enthusiasm in what you're saying, Henry. Are you becoming immune to my charms? Okay. That made me laugh a little, and I gave an answer that I later regretted. Have a good weekend, and I'll buy new locks for the door by Monday. She giggles. Next week we will start working with a cane and try to take you off the walker. I like the sound of that. Agreed. It passed for making fun of Nurse Payne, and with it she left. Friday dragged on like every day. Dan was trimming the bushes in front of the house, the Daniels were walking, and Herb visited Sally Perkins. I was thinking about how life had become so terribly predictable when a black BMW pulled into the carpenter's driveway. I must have missed Jenny pulling into her garage. I was wondering if they have a regular schedule. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and how long has it been going on? I made myself a sandwich and helped myself to a beer, and then calmly watched the suit drive away, followed ten minutes later by Sally. Then a terrible melancholy came over me. I liked those two, Sally and Chris. They are caring and kind. They always seem to be loving and attentive to each other. 
what I've seen now seems so terrible, out of keeping with her character. I searched my imagination for a plausible explanation and admitted that it was all speculation on my part, but it bothered me terribly. I did two things that weekend. I watched to see if the suit would visit them while Chris was at home, and I started making plans. He never came, and my plans were moving fast. I was very worried about what I was up to. If someone had asked me if I was sure I was doing the right thing, I would have replied, I don't know. But what I knew for sure was that if I approached Jenny with anything like an accusation, she would deny everything, and I would be called an insulting old man, and I would lose two friends. If I go to Chris, he'll lash out at me, and again, I'll be branded an abusive old man and lose two friends. And if I ignore it, it will be difficult for me to look Chris in the eye and pretend to be his friend, hiding the painful truth from him. The only solution was to help him see for himself and hope that I was wrong. Over the weekend, I made a list of my needs if I expand the store as planned. By that time, I was already thinking about tables and chairs. I need an open space to move large pieces of wood to the machines, as well as 240-volt electricity in several places. I also need a place for workbenches where I can work by manually fitting mortise and tenon joints. And then I need a clean space for finishing. In general, I need to at least double my current space. I sketched out a few ideas, playing with several concepts, until I realized that I also needed additional wood storage space, because tables need large pieces of solid wood, and cabinets use a lot of high-quality plywood with high-quality veneer for drawers. It was all turning into a lot of work. I went to bed Sunday night with a heavy heart, knowing that the coming week was likely to be painful for someone, but I also knew that that someone could be me. Monday morning came, and with it the arrival of the pain nurse. I knew what to do, and by that time even I understood that we were making progress. If torture means I can go back to work, then let it be torture. She left me sipping coffee again and balancing an ice pack on my knee. I tried to work, but my mind couldn't focus. Dan was mowing the lawn again and the Daniels went out for a walk. Jim Perkins returned from his travels, but he still had an office in the city where he worked. So Herb visited Sally Perkins again. I couldn't help but wonder why someone stays married if they feel the need to cheat on their spouse. Is it money, security, or just a bad habit? Wasn't this a game for them? Some despicable way to bring a little excitement into their boring lives? They probably think they'll never get caught. I liked both Herb's wife and Sally's husband. They deserve better. It was noon, and I watched as Jenny pulled into her garage and rolled down the door. Five minutes later, a black BMW pulled into the road, and I saw the suit re-enter the carpenter house as if he lived there. The decision was made, and I knew what to do. An hour later, the suit left, and after a while, Jenny left. It broke my heart. Monday and Tuesday passed without much incident. I tried to do business, answered random calls from the workshop, and watched the neighbors. Nothing seemed to have changed. On Wednesday morning, I watched Chris go to work. Maggie came and checked on me, and then I sat with ice and coffee and watched her drive away. The time has come. I picked up my cell phone and called Chris. Chris Carpenter here. Chris, this is Henry Bennett. How are you? All right, Henry. To what do I owe this pleasure? That phrase pierced me like a knife. If everything goes as I expect, no one will enjoy it. I was wondering if I could tempt you with a sandwich and a beer for lunch. I could hear him giggling. Wow, you! It is difficult to refuse such an offer. And since you're going to be here, I'm thinking about expanding my workshop and I'd like to see what ideas you might have, Chris thought for a moment. Of course, I can come by your place tonight and we can work on your ideas. But now it's the turn of the big hype. Actually, my children are going to come to visit today and I have everything ready. I was hoping that you could come today, say at 11.30 or at noon. I hated lying to him that way. Of course, why not? I could use a break from the routine. Okay, I'll come over for lunch, and we can talk about the new workshop. Great, see you. I felt like shit. There are a dozen ways things could have gone wrong, starting with Chris calling his wife Jenny and the suit not coming today. She'll see Chris's car in my driveway, and so on. I was sure that in any case I would be able to declare my ignorance. But wouldn't that make me a coward? Unfortunately for everyone, Jenny and the suit turned out to be as predictable as the rest of my neighbors. Chris arrived at about 11.45 a.m. and joined me in the front room. 
I spread out all my notes and drawings, and after Chris brought us each a beer from the fridge, we settled down with sandwiches, chips, and a cold glass. Then everything went according to plan. We sat down at a table by my front window and started going through the list of my needs as I saw them. I showed him the blueprint of my current workshop and started showing sketches of what was on my mind. At 12.05, Jenny drove into her garage. Chris watched her for a while with a slightly confused but happy smile on his face, and then we resumed the conversation and were at a fairly productive stage of developing plans when a black BMW drove into Chris's driveway at 12.10. Chris was talking and suddenly stopped when a suit got out of the car and walked back in his front door as if he lived there. I silently watched my friend and waited. He tried to return to the drawings but to no avail. I guess it took about 10 minutes while Chris was trying to talk, studying the plans, but going back to watching his house until my friend said, I'm sorry. Without another word, he got up, went out the front door and crossed the street to his house. It was strange, but I could swear that this time I watched a man walk through his own front door as if he no longer lived there and wondered how long he would be my neighbor. My window was open and after a few moments I heard a commotion. There were screams, shouts, and it seems furniture was thrown. I heard the sound of broken glass and loud banging of chairs against the wall. Shortly after, a half-dressed suit ran out of the front door, jumped into a car, and sped off. After that, there was silence. Time passed, and just when I began to worry that Chris might have harmed his wife, he left his house as he had entered it, and walked back across the street to my house. He just plopped down on my couch with that thousand-mile stare I've heard about and didn't say anything. I decided that my task was to wait until he was ready to speak, and at the right moment he said, This scum made love to him in our bed, can you believe it? Isn't that Jenny of all people? I stood up and handed him the rest of the beer, saying, Here it is, have a drink and I'll get you some more. He drank it in one gulp. Thinking that he needed to talk, I asked, Have you seen them? He just nodded. Are you sure that all this is consensual? He spoke as if he was in a daze. I heard her. She was a willing participant. Despite all my observations and plans, I didn't know what to do next. So I brought Chris a second beer and sat back down to be an interested listener, which I assumed he needed. Finally, he started. A husband should never expect what I saw. My wife was naked with this jerk. She wrapped her legs around him and made all the same noises as with me, only louder. She enjoyed it. Then Chris looked at me and said, I saw him when he got off her. There's nothing special about him. This was supposed to be a leisurely discussion, and I need to let my friend talk as much as he wants. When he was silent long enough, I said, I heard a lot of noise, as if windows were being broken and furniture was being thrown. You didn't do anything you'd regret, did you? Then after a pause, he said, No, except for marrying that cheater. At that time, I saw Jenny's car slowly backing onto the road. She seemed to hesitate for a while and then drove away. I think I just saw Jenny leave. Yes, I told her to get her cheating ass out of the house. Chris's hands were shaking and his complexion looked like death. I knew that the next phrase would sound bad, but I had to say it. It takes you a while to come to terms with what just happened. Maybe it's not the end of the world. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but I know that the girl loves you. Maybe you can build a relationship when you have a little time to think about it. The look he gave me wasn't encouraging. That's when I made my big mistake. Thinking that misfortune loves company, I blabbed, You're not alone. Herb Jackson visits Sally Perkins' house every day while her husband is at work. Chris just shook his head in disgust and muttered something under his breath. Then he turned to me. You knew, didn't you? Is that why you asked me to come today? What's the matter? Does this asshole show up every day like clockwork? I tried not to interfere, but you can't say no to Chris. Well? With great reluctance, I answered. On Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, as far as I can tell. For how long? Chris's rage grew. Last week and now this week. I don't know how long this has been going on. For a while, I stopped worrying about Jenny and started worrying about myself. Chris showed signs of a beaten man and there was anger in his eyes. I remember thinking, this is what happens when a wife cheats on her husband. She robs him of his pride, and then anger takes over. For a while, Chris's anger seemed to dissipate when my friend put his face in his hands and sobbed. At that moment, I was overcome with regret, and I wondered again if I should have just closed my eyes and let things go the way they were meant to, 
but these idiots parked their car right in front of the house where all the neighbors could see it. What did they expect? At least Herb is trying to be a little restrained, although I no longer respect him for that. After that, there was a long and mostly quiet hour while Chris drank his second and eventually third beer. I tried to find a way to assure him that his action was justified, and at the same time I reminded him that she loved him, even if it didn't seem like it now. I don't know how successful it was. On his cell phone, Chris informed the office that he would not be there today, and eventually went home after I invited him to stay as long as he wanted. He just shook his head, saying, Sooner or later I will have to face this, and it's better to let it happen sooner. He left his car at my door and returned to his house a broken man. He came back an hour later and I poured him another beer. He said, I've cleaned up most of the mess. Perhaps there are still fragments of a broken mirror in the carpet. When I asked how the mirror turned out to be broken, he smiled. The son of a bitch ducked. The chair missed him and hit the mirror. In a stupid attempt to support him, I said, I was surprised that he was able to leave on his own. Yes, I'm sorry about that. Well, that's good. You don't want to go to jail because of that asshole. He just shrugged and shook his head as if he didn't know. We sat and drank until the evening. I warmed up the leftover roast in a failed attempt to sober up, and Jenny never came home that night. Then, for a long time after dark, Chris made a lonely journey to his home. On Thursday morning, Chris's car was still parked in my driveway, so I called him at home after due time in the hope that he might be up and sober. He didn't answer the first time, but called back half an hour later. He was in the shower when I called. I asked him, Do you want to have breakfast? I can cook or you can take us somewhere. Why don't I go? Are you able to drive? He just laughed sadly and said, Yes, I can drive. I'll be there in ten minutes. He kept his word and was at my door ten minutes later. We stopped at a diner in the city where I decided that my job was just to listen if he wanted to talk. There were other people around us, so we were quiet. Jenny had called late the night before, trying to apologize. She spoke through tears, and to Chris's credit, he held himself in check. He wasn't ready to meet her, so she said that when he was ready, she would be at her sister's house. After that, I didn't hear much about their confrontation. Chris came over once or twice a week, and we had a few beers while he asked vague and mostly introspective questions about marriage. I have a clear impression that things are not going well. This impression was confirmed when a for-sale sign appeared in the courtyard of the house. He said they were getting divorced and that he was grateful that they didn't have children yet. The most revealing thing he said about this was that in therapy, Jenny admitted that she was very good at dividing her life and that her lover had nothing to do with their marriage. Chris just shook his head and muttered, fucking psychopath, and that was the end of our conversation. He found out that the affair had lasted longer than he could forgive. It was sad to see their marriage break up and I asked myself many times if I shouldn't have just turned a blind eye to it in the hope that Jenny would get smarter and Chris would never find out about it. Inevitably, I asked myself how I would feel if I were Chris, and each time I decided that I would hate the friend who kept this secret from me. Jenny and Chris got divorced and went their separate ways. It took years for Chris to confide in another woman, but when he did, it seemed like the choice was a good one. He met a widow his own age with young children, and she knew what loyalty was. Chris always wanted children and treated fatherhood like a duck treats water. We remained friends, and he built an extension to my workshop. As for me, I didn't get married anymore. I have already told you that my wife died two years before the knee surgery. She was everything I ever wanted to have in a partner, and I miss her still. I decided that one was my limit and I no longer tempted fate. However, I have several girlfriends who don't make any claims against me. Can't get pregnant no matter how hard we try and still like to sleep with a man from time to time. Yes, menopause is our friend. I have a good job, wonderful kids, and company when I want it. Life is good. However, life is not so good for Herbert Jackson alone. It all happened about two weeks after Chris found his wife with that suit. I was sitting by my window. By that time, I was already moving around quite well with the help of a cane and dividing my time between the office and home. I wasn't ready to work on the shop floor yet, but I was gradually getting there. I was looking through the blueprints for remodeling the kitchen and making estimates when I heard the familiar sound of breaking glass and furniture hitting the wall. I looked at the Perkins house and saw Herb Jackson running out of the front door naked and running down the street with his trousers in his hands, followed by Jim Perkins brandishing a baseball bat. I said to myself, another one is caught. Jim looked very motivated, 
and I estimated Herb's chances of getting home to be no higher than 50. 50. I never found out who tipped Jim Perkins off, but I suspect it could have been a very evil carpenter who lived nearby. A week after that, I finally returned to the workshop, worked late and thanked Providence that I was no longer sitting at my window and watching the life of the neighbors in my own Peyton place. In a moment of resentment or anger, characters often say the wrong things, so I have to point out that Jenny probably wasn't a psychopath, as Chris said in anger. This is a common insult. A sociopath or a narcissist may be suitable, but an egoist and a liar are for sure. I know that some readers will seek revenge. She works well in fiction, but in real life, you can only rarely find real revenge. It's unfair, but that's the reality.